thank you. Um, je m'excuse, mais je ne parle pas bien le français et je présenterai donc en anglais. Uh, un moment. Dites-moi de ralentir, s'il vous plaît. I hope I just said I don't speak French very well, so I'm going to speak in English, and please slow me down. So people in the front especially, just do this if I'm talking too fast. I tend to talk very quickly. So thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful introduction, Philippe. Um, it's an honor to be here at Blend, Blend Web Mix, and um, I really, really have enjoyed my trip here to Lyon so far. It's, you have such an amazing city. It's been, it's been beautiful here. Um, I wanted to start by just explaining a few of the biases and limitations that I represent. Uh, as you can see, and as Philippe mentioned in, in his uh, lovely introduction, I've worked at a number of technology companies. I like to joke with my students that I tend to pick companies with blue logos. I don't know why. So I decided to go to Google to make it a little bit more colorful. Um, because of the logos that are there, you'll notice that these are mostly Western countries. Um, I've worked for over 20 years in technology and in consulting and in academia, but my point of view is very Western. It's also very United States, and over the past eight years, it's been very Bay Area, so very San Francisco, Silicon Valley, um, and very enterprise. So large companies is where I've done most of my work. Uh, I have, have spent some time in consulting and academia, but I think the majority of my last 10 years has really been influenced by my time in technology. What I wanted to do today was to share some thoughts on where I've seen UX, user experience, going in tech. Before I do that, I'd love to do a, just a little poll and ask how many people have been in their job up to four years? So zero to four. And raise hands. So OK. And then how about between four and eight? So quatre à huit. OK, fewer. And then how about um, uh, eight and more? So plus, plus huit. <laughs> OK, awesome. Thank you very much. And just again, show of hands, how many people represent academe, academia, college, university? You can vote multi multiple times. Um, how about business? Work for companies? OK. Uh, consulting? Okay, good, few consultants. Uh, government or nonprofit? Okay, good, yeah, God bless you. Um, <laughs> it's important for us to have a wide range of people when we talk about technology and user experience. Um, I'm not going to ask about the roles because I've received a lot of information about the different roles. Um, but what I try to do is I try to present to designers and researchers, those are my dominant audiences, however, more and more, I'm also presenting to managers and people in marketing and people in analytics. And, of course, developers and engineers above all of these groups. And what I would like to talk about is why focusing on user experience is necessary in order for us to deliver tech for good. And you'll notice I'll try to walk from the podium, um, but my notes are on the podium, so I might sneak back every once in a while if I forget, so that you can use that. Um, to focus on me and my presentation style. I would argue that if we don't focus on user experience, we risk making mistakes that makes tech for good often impossible. So let's talk about a few examples. Without paying attention to user experience, we end up with systems like this one. This was a text message that showed up on mobile devices for people in the United States, um, uh, United States state of Hawaii. You might have heard of this in early 2018. And it said, emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. For 28 minutes, people had this note on their mobile device with no other notification. 28 minutes later, emergency alert. There is no missile threat or danger to the state of Hawaii. Repeat, false alarm. So for 28 terrifying minutes, the people of the state of Hawaii thought they were under attack. And if you pay attention to United States politics, you can understand that there are some tensions that the US is having with other countries, which makes this a believable threat. The people of Hawaii 
basically spent 30 minutes trying to figure out, where do I go? Like a missile threat, what, what do I do? And then finally the system told them, oh, just kidding, it's not really a threat. What happened is that they were running a drill. And so emergency services personnel in Hawaii were trying to practice for when they would have a threat to make sure they were prepared. And reportedly, this is the interface that the controller had access to when they had to issue the drill. You'll notice on the interface, even if you don't speak English, there's no real organization here. It's just a group of blue links. Reportedly, the correct response was down toward the bottom. It says drill, PACOM, CDW, state only. The operator selected this one that says PACOM, CDW, state only, without the word drill. It actually makes quite a bit of sense to me because it shows up right underneath something that says test. So if I'm doing a test, I'll select what's under test. But unfortunately, that was the wrong one to pick, and we know what happens. Let's talk about another example of what happens when we don't pay attention to user experience. Another company with a blue logo in the United States, named Microsoft, introduced a product called Bob in 1995. Bob was introduced to provide a user interface for customers who didn't understand what it was like to use a drag and drop interface with a mouse. This was for Windows 3, if you remember. Windows 3, see a couple people shaking their heads. Proud to have lived through Windows 3. Um, the Bob interface had an avatar. There was a talking dog in this version, and it said, hello, what are you trying to do? And you might say, I'm trying to write a letter. And it would say, oh, to write a letter, you click on this typewriter that shows up on this image of of a, a study or a living room. Because Microsoft did not pay attention to user experience, they didn't really understand what people were struggling with as they tried to use their Windows interface, their product went on to become known as one of the biggest software flops of all time. In fact, even Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft back during its time, said, there is nothing that we have undertaken, with a couple exceptions like Microsoft Bob, where we have decided that we have not succeeded and let's stop. So even the CEO acknowledges that this was a very poor experience. And they lost a lot of money, they lost a lot of brand credibility, and users, I think, lost a lot of faith in the company as being able to offer something usable and, and useful for them. And then there's another example that I like to throw out because technology doesn't have to just be digital. This one comes from the company BIC. They make pens, uh, Le Stilo. Um, and they came out with this product launch in 2011, I believe, which was called BIC for Her. Finally, a pen for women. <laughs> Isn't that called a pen? So BIC for Her was marketed as always the perfect accessory. It came in pink and purple and light shades of red. And I don't know what else makes it different. I don't know why this pen even exists. In 2016, Bic finally acknowledged this was a failure and they discontinued the product. I think that when we don't pay attention to user experience, we make a risk of designing toward a stereotype or designing toward our impression or perception of people and what they need without actually understanding what they need. This is a reference to an article by Kat Holmes. She's a director at Google. And she talks about when we use design around a stereotype, it often just propagates the bad images that people have of, of people. Instead of thinking of people as people, we think of them as a disability or as a demographic, like gender or age. We need to really focus on the whole person. So I like to mention that user experience, when I think about it, promotes tech for good, because it focuses on having a deep understanding of users and what they need and what they value, as well as their abilities and their limitations.
So without an understanding of needs and values, we really cannot design tech for good. I believe that user experience fundamentals have changed, and I think this is a, a wonderful thing, because we are now in an era where user experience seems more important than ever. And, oops, clicker, there we go. Uh, Thomas J. Watson Jr. from IBM, many, many years ago, when he took over leadership of the company from his father, said, good design is good business. He was talking about his style and how they would build and market IBM products. But to this day, we now are starting to believe in this as more than just a brand message. There's research that shows that companies are now really starting to realize that they need to attract and retain loyal users. As Catherine Courage, Vice President at Google, Vice President for User Experience says, people won't stick around and use a poorly designed site or app. McKinsey and Company, a consulting firm, did a study of 300 global companies in different parts of the world, in different verticals, different products, and they identified design practices that correlate with higher revenue and higher stake, uh, shareholder returns. And what they found was four themes, four types of practices that companies do that actually deliver more value to customers and to stakeholders. These include analytical leadership, everybody measuring the user experience, cross-functional talent, involving everyone in user experience, not just the user experience team or the design team or even the engineering team, everybody has to be involved in user experience. Continuous iteration is the idea that companies are working to understand user experience and work with users all the time, before, during, after product launches. And then finally, user experience thinking is about breaking down walls and silos that naturally show up in companies to encourage everybody to think about user experience. The authors of this study say many of the key drivers of this strong and consistent design environment, they require company-level leadership investment. And so what we're seeing is a change in leadership expectations. You see articles like these, the rise of leadership in the, in the C-suite, the CEO, the chief design officer, and how they are populating our companies. And whoops. UX Design Institute says, if you've been thinking about a career in UX, now is definitely the time to get started. It's seen as a, as a growing, burgeoning industry where maybe many of us have come into it because of what we're hearing about the rise of design. And when we look at companies, we see growing investments in UX expertise. IBM used to have one designer for every 72 engineers. They have drastically reduced that ratio by hiring many, many, many people in design and related design fields. So now the ratio is more like one to eight. For the mobile uh, programs, for the mobile design groups, I heard that the ratio is more like one to three. And you notice this uh, similar investments being made in companies like LinkedIn and Dropbox. Again, Catherine Courage says, these days an established design team is as standard as a product management or an engineering team. Co-founder of Figma, Dylan Field, says to hire good designers, founders have to battle over them, and it's only going to get worse. So this is creating a tension in our field of user experience. We have expectations that are evolving from hiring managers. Back maybe 10 years ago, there was this idea of the UX unicorn. This person, who, this person who could do everything in UX. They could design, they could do engineering, they could do content writing, they could do usability testing and research. And it's just one person. So it's easy, my company just needs to hire one person and I'll have perfect user experience. Now, most companies acknowledge that that's really not true. It requires an army of people dedicated to user experience to actually get the job right. More and more companies are recognizing just how broad, deep, and multifaceted UX design really is. And as a result, UX requires a team. Jacob Nielsen, one of the grandfathers of the field of usability, says UX constitutes many different specialties. 
Forcing one person to do it all is a prescription for mediocrity. So we need to have a team experience for UX. As a result of these investments, we're seeing job expansion continue. We're seeing companies, including CNN Money, not long ago, identified research and design and UX as one of the fastest growing fields globally. And that's amazing. Nielsen has said the UX profession has grown substantially since 1950, and the expected growth until 2050 will dwarf, dwarf anything we've seen so far. That's amazing. It's a wonderful time to be a designer and a researcher and a person working in content. And what this means is that companies are starting to understand the importance of context and the meaning of experience behind technology, which leads us toward greater good opportunities for tech. For example, most companies now identify that metrics need meaning. So many companies that historically re re relied on customer satisfaction, net promoter score, or reliability and quality indexes now understand that these numbers without additional information don't mean much. Who said that? Why did they say it? When did they say it? What were they trying to accomplish? Who were they with? These are all important parts of context that we now need to worry about. We know from Aaron Walter, I believe spoke at a previous Blend Web Mix, that emotions matter. If we're only looking at numbers, we're not getting the full rich picture of what it, what it is to be a human experiencing your product. We need to think about functional expectations and things like reliability and response time, and of course usability. But we also need to think about pleasure, even in enterprise user experience. If a person must use a product to accomplish their job, then having them be miserable is not a great way to ensure success and quality in that job. So we need to think about pleasure for all users of all products. We also need to think about values. So not just is this product something that makes you feel good, but it makes you feel good inside. It's consistent with your values if you believe in sustainability, if you believe in connecting people, growing people, the product has to resonate with you. If not, you'll be disconnected from it. I think the rise of the design thinking movement over the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, has really emphasized the need for empathy and the need for understanding what it's like to walk in a person's shoes before we can even begin to think about designing or developing solutions for those people. And here's a, a video, it's a clip, I know it's very choppy, but it highlights some of the benefits of focusing on empathy. This was created by a, d a design consultancy called Standby um, here in Europe. And what they were doing is they were looking at a, a cycle share, like a bike, bike share program, and trying to understand what would it be like if you're not a cycler, if you don't bike most often, what's the experience like? So they followed people who cycled around the streets of London, Italy, other, other uh, regions here in Europe, to understand what is that like and how can we design better for these people. Really capturing the full journey is important. Understanding not only what it's like before a person uses your product and during the different phases and then also after. And I think journey thinking which has led us to uh, see a revival in initiatives like journey mapping, and of course service blueprinting, business canvases, has really given us a deeper understanding and respect for what it's like to use our products in different contexts. The image on the right-hand side is actually from a coworker of mine back at Salesforce, and um, our team was exploring different ways to study emotion, and how do users' emotions change as they're using business software? And I think maybe 20 years ago, people would say, why would you care about a person's emotions while they're, using, why, while they're using software? But what we found was that the emotions followed a very distinct pattern based on where the person was with the product. And if we as a design team or an engineering team can focus on that, we can improve the experience that all of our customers have. So all of this has given us um, an opportunity to really have a deeper appreciation for user experience. Unfortunately, within the field of user experience, we have our own struggles, and we're still trying to figure things out as we grow up. One is, I'll just take a moment and say, I 
learned how to create animated GIFs, um, so that's why you see a bunch of these. This is the last one, I promise. Um, there are major ownership I issues. Now that we have chief design officers at companies, teams are saying, well, I should own user experience. No, I should own user experience. No, why do you own it? I own it. So we're seeing these tugs of war happening within companies. We're also seeing a rise in data, many data sources coming from different research methods with multiple owners. And instead of trying to embrace all of the data, the data and understand what they mean, we're fighting over it. We're saying, oh, your data isn't as good as my data. Oh, market research, that's terrible. It's user research that's better. Oh, no, not user research. It's logs analysis and behavioral research. Oh, logs analysis are terrible. It's data science and machine learning models. We're fighting over who owns the data instead of realizing that all of us should own the data and understand where the data is telling us to go as a company. It reminds me of the um, parable of the blind man and the elephant, where you have multiple individuals who, are, who don't have sight, and they're touching different parts of an elephant to try to understand what they're looking at. And the person who's touching the ear of the elephant feels like, oh, maybe this is canvas. Maybe I'm touching a textile. The person touching the, the tail, is like, oh, this feels like hair. Maybe, maybe I'm touching the long hair of somebody. They don't realize that they're all touching the same thing. It's an elephant. So when we focus on only one part of the puzzle for user experience, we basically prevent our companies from understanding the entire whole. Ray Kroc, ironically, uh, founder of McDonald's, <laughs> said, none of us is as good as all of us. And I take this as a, as a sign to remind us that we have to collaborate in terms of how we own our processes and our methods. We need to look at our different data sources. Maybe it's engagement. Maybe it's customer satisfaction. Maybe it's usability. But if we're not collaboratively owning that, then we're just working in these little silos. And that prevents our company from understanding whether or not we're doing a good thing. So what we need to do is move beyond conventional notions of user experience. And I'm seeing this in pockets. So for example, there's this article in Fast Company, came out a couple years ago, and it said design roles are changing. Historically, we've seen roles that call themselves things like visual design creative design, design research, usability tester. And they're predicting that many of these roles will go away in the future because they've kind of become a catch-all. They're almost meaningless. So instead of seeing UX design as a job I need, I realize that there might be dozens of jobs I need that cover different parts of UX design working together as a whole. There's new opportunities and responsibilities as a result of this. We have new materials that we are designing with. Artificial intelligence is a new design material. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of many universities that are helping educate AI designers and machine learning designers. That will absolutely become a necessary skill if it isn't already. There's also skills like post-industrial designers, Design not only for the product or the service, design for the ecosystem, design for the APIs, design for everything that your product talks to. So now you're no longer a designer. You're a designer and an engineer and an architect. You're probably a content specialist. So you need to do a little bit of everything to have a really big understanding of what's going on from a company perspective. I think there's also a strong need for the rise of futures thinking. And there's a phrase that's been thrown around for many years called VUCA. I don't know if there's an analog in French, but it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So becoming a designer, becoming an engineer, becoming a writer and a researcher in a world that is VUCA is very difficult to do because you don't know where the world is going. So as a result, there are a number of techniques that people need to learn about how to project what will happen or what might happen in the future. Oops. In research, my domain, I'm seeing an emphasis on insights and foundations over answers. 
So instead of bringing somebody in and doing a usability study to identify what problem do I need to fix, we're expecting researchers to come in and help me understand questions and problems I don't even know exist. So instead of saying, hey, fix this product, I'm saying, hey, what should I be thinking about in the next two years? Which is great. I think that's an amazing advancement for research. The bad news is that many of our product teams and our stakeholders still need answers. If we're focusing on foundational insights and helping our companies design the future, how do we make sure that the today that we've designed is actually working? So we need to figure out who owns what and how do we do this in a cost-effective and sustainable way. Similarly, the world of design is seeing a real big preponderance of design systems, design libraries, ways of thinking about design. I think that's awesome. I bring up uh, Salesforce and Google examples here. I like these examples because they start with principles and values. They basically say, even if we don't have a pattern for what you're looking for, here's a way to think about this. And you can use those values as ways of creating new aspects of the design system. And I know Haley talked about that in her talk yesterday. Part of the challenge of design systems, though, is that it's actually making design more predictable, which I think is a good thing from a usability perspective. But what it might be doing is it's creating a monoculture. So as every design, every company has a design system that says, oh, this is the way you create the search pattern or the selection pattern, there might be a risk that everything will look the same. And if we think about the role of design and the role of art historically, much of that role has been to provoke thinking and change and threaten even the way we feel comfortable today. So how are we going to get to what John Maida here says? How do we get to what great art does? It makes us wonder and think. And great design makes things clear. It solves problems. How do we inject some of the art back into our design if the world is run by design systems and design libraries? I think that's going to be a challenge that we're going to see if many of our design schools start to um, grapple with. And part of the opportunity here is an emphasis on greater teamwork and diversity. We're getting, there's a lot of research now that shows that diverse teams are better. Historically, we would say this as a truism, but now there's quite a bit of research in management and marketing and business to show that if you have a diverse team, you actually make more money as a company. There's a great study out on Silicon Valley venture capital, and what they find is the more diverse funding groups actually make better decisions that returns better investments um, for their stakeholders. By engaging in more teamwork, we actually have a better chance of solving a lot of these challenges. Reed Hastings, uh, CEO of Netflix, is known for saying, do not tolerate, tolerate, tolerate brilliant jerks. The cost to teamwork is too high. I think more and more this is becoming true in both large companies as well as small companies. We have to learn to work together and appreciate each other's diversity rather than treating somebody who is the brilliant jerk as the person with all of the answers. As a result, the final tension that I'm seeing, this tension of ownership, is moving toward cross-functional team ownership. It doesn't matter that you work for marketing or design or engineering. It's important for all of us to be involved in the work of user experience. Maybe that means have a developer interview a customer. Maybe that means have a person in marketing analyze data. Maybe that means having somebody who works in uh, product management, engage in ideation, and come up with new design ideas. I think cross-functional team ownership is ultimately a direction that our field will go in to support better tech for good. So here's my, uh, my local slide. <laughs> um, I went out and saw, saw the bridge by the um, uh, what, uh, court, courthouse, is that a court up hell? I, thank you. Uh, and it's beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous location. This is not my picture. I have a bunch of pictures, but the weather wasn't as good. And um, I think what we need to do now is to start thinking about how do we bridge these gaps? How do we take these tensions and these opportunities and make sure that the decisions we're making are going toward tech for good 
and not toward tech for optimization or tech for only my revenue or tech for only solving one problem? How do we actually get to tech for good? I think a lot of this comes down to us having a code. And especially for user experience, because it's such a diverse field, we don't have one uniform code. Many organizations, the World Health Organization, for example, have a set of ethical principles that they hold dear and that they try to use when they're making decisions. I think we need to do the same thing in the world of user experience and design. I know many researchers have ethics codes. Those are more along the lines of, how do I ensure that the research I do treats people with respect? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, as we design, what code are we following? Dorothy Shemansky writes an article in User Experience Magazine where she recommends that we look toward architecture. So these principles come from the well-being code that comes from architecture in terms of designing buildings. So sure, we want to design buildings to be accessible, and we want them to be safe and to be ergonomically uh, compliant so that everyone can take advantage of them. But we also want to build buildings to enable movement and beauty and security and peace of mind. We could do a lot if we just borrow these principles from architecture and use them in the fields of design. I think as a field, we need to represent our users' values. I think a lot of companies do a wonderful job designing, maybe even researching and supporting usability, but they're not focusing on users' values. So what are the core values of the users that you're designing and building for today? If you don't know, then ask yourself, who will be responsible for that? Perhaps it's you. I think we need to protect our users. Unfortunately, that's just the world we're in. This is a shot from an article from Fast Company where they looked at over um, a thousand shopping sites and they found that most, if not all of them, have dark patterns. Dark patterns are just design interaction patterns or graphical tricks that we use to get people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. Kind of like the decline button that moves around and you can't click on it. We have to figure out, is there an opportunity for us to build principles and things like design systems that protect our users? And also, how do we respect our users? Uh, Nir Eyal makes the argument that for many products that are habit-forming, for example, products with feeds like Facebook or Twitter, that ultimately it's upon the user. You could decide not to use Twitter, and the problem, the habit goes away. But I think it's a more conversational, I think there's an opportunity for a conversational approach. Apple and Google both have initiatives to help users understand how they're using their mobile devices. I think this is a good first step to helping us have a conversation about what is healthy and what is not healthy from a product usability perspective. We also, I believe, have a duty to understand the full impact of our designs. So I think, I'm guessing at a conference like this, most of us have these things, these devices. But if you've never seen an electric waste site where all of our device's components go away after the phone no longer has usefulness for us, we are robbing ourselves of a very fundamental uh, change. We need to make sure that we're designing in a sustainable manner. Similarly, if we think about cloud computing and all of the calculations and all of the data that's being crunched in the cloud, we like to think of the cloud as this, it's this vaporous thing, it's a cloud. No, the cloud is actually a bunch of data, server, uh, data center servers that are eating a lot of electricity and generating a lot of heat. So what are the consequences of those decisions that we're making? So one thing I ask, and now I'm at Google, so everything I ask is through a how might we question, how might we extend design thinking, that need for empathy? How might we extend that toward human values that can guide our organizations? How do we make our organizations know what our users value? And how might we encourage the design and the research and the user experience community toward affirming our connected connectedness as a species and as part of a planet, a closed ecosystem? How might we do that with the decisions that we make day to day? 
And of course, how might we prioritize sustainability in our design systems? How might we provide, um, prioritize it in our research? What does sustainability even look like, especially for an enterprise company? I think these are important questions for us to try to tackle. I also think that we have a need as, a, as an organization to address the skills gap. Again, I said at the beginning, I work in San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. That's like a little oasis. We have a lot of user experience talent. We have very smart engineers, designers, researchers, marketers. But there are many other places in the country, in the United States where I live, or around the world, that don't have access to these pools of resources. So how do we as a community come together to address those needs and address that gap? So I look here, this is uh, from an executive rec recruiting firm that came out just this uh, year. UX is one of the most difficult roles for companies to fill. There's a shortage of experienced professionals, so demand is currently outstripping supply. So we know that that's a problem right now. So how do we work together to address that in the future? Dylan Field, again, Figma, says, preparing the next generation of designers will have to be a collaborative effort among schools, industry, and design tool companies. And so I asked this, how might we question? How might we build our community? How might we partner with each other, maybe to develop a men mentoring programs? How might we explore new ways of working to share critical talent where it's needed? Maybe if my company has a bunch of really brilliant data scientists and you need access to them, how might we share that while still protecting company secrets, etc.? How might we move in that direction? And then finally, how might we foster strategic and futures thinking? A lot of the challenges that we have today are because we're not accustomed to thinking long term. We're accustomed to thinking, what will happen when I launch this product? What will happen when users experience this service? But we don't think, what happens in five years? What happens if we're wildly successful and everyone is using this? We typically don't go that far. So I think we need to foster strategic and futures thinking. And the how might we, the, how might we question is, how might we consider future needs and scenarios as a team? And how might we anticipate the future consequences of our work? So to recap, and this is the homework that I'm going to ask you all to do. Think about each of these six how might we's that I've ta talked about. And think about which one you can take action on and promote tech for good. Perhaps you could guide your organization toward understanding the values that your users have. Perhaps it's figuring out how to ensure that the products and services you're building are connecting people, or connecting people to the system they're part of, like sustainability. Perhaps it's coming up with ways to inform and defend your users, our users, to ensure that their values are always at the forefront of decisions being made by the company. And how do we partner to develop these mentoring programs and then promote strategic and futures thinking by the team? Merci. Thanks a lot. Thank um, right, so dozens of questions. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, first run, and, and that's really not a loaded question. That's a v okay. but, but it's key, and that's what you're talking about. We, we went from uh, speaking of design starting with packaging, then look and feel, now it's emotion. All right, uh, and, and there's also this intensely bad design of Dac Partens, and you, yeah, you see, uh, do you want to subscribe? Yes, not now. Yeah. To which my answer is usually, fuck you. <laughs> uh, but did, this builds up, uh, of course, some level of hostility, but there's also from uh, the designers inside the company, this kind of, uh, what do we do now? Do we need a code of ethics? Do you need a code of ethics? Or do you need to really apply the values of the company? And the question is, are these values clear? We all have this mission statement. And again, not loaded uh, toward Google, but Salesforce, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazon. Amazon, at the, at the end of the day, is about shipping stuff in parcels. Okay, so there's a limit of design, and 
you can coat it with as much ethics of design as you want, you are going to ship parcels to people. So do you put a limit to that? Do you say, we are Amazon, we don't ship more than X parcels a week to you because that's not responsible? Yeah. Uh, that's my question. Yeah, nice, quick, short, easy question, Philippe. Uh, and let me uh, just, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, the slides are on SlideShare if people want access to the resources. There's a, there's a link for every resource there. I, the answer is a great, it's a, it's a great question. I don't think the answer, honestly, probably the answer isn't even possible. But I would ask everybody within a company, do you even know what the values of your users are versus what the values of the company are? And I think many of us who've been through business or if you're a few years older, than three, let's say, in a company. You've probably been through the process of building a mission statement. You know, what are, what, are, what are we here? What are our values? But do you actually take time to connect those values back to the population of people who use your product? So if I were at Amazon or, or you know, even Google, I think the number one question for me is, what are the company's values? And do I even know if they connect back to my, my population that I'm designing for? Um, a lot of times it's just about, uh, what do they call it, you know, sunlight, yeah. shine a light on it. Um, so my first, you know, my first principle or my first task would be just no. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and just to quickly, do you feel that in the Silicon Valley right now, uh, how, how many companies, how many persons of companies do you think the, the values are clear and opposable in the sense that if you say, well, we are nice with users, we don't kill people, <laughs> right. thank you for that. No one is saying the opposite of that. So what are you really saying? How many companies do you think right now, major companies are, have really clear and straightforward uh, values? How many would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. I, don't, I, I wouldn't have a, an estimate just because whatever I say will be wrong. Um, but what I will say is that I think now, at least in Silicon Valley, as a result of GDPR, um, as a result of CCPA, so all of the privacy laws and regulations that are happening both in Europe as well as in the United States and in other parts of the world, we're starting to see people be very focused on the role of things like privacy and security. I don't know if we're tying that back to values. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing it because it's what we are currently paying attention to. My fear is that if we don't know what our users truly value and if we don't know long term the, the consequences of decisions, we're, we're at a mismatch. And really last and quick question. Uh, give us some advice. Uh, be bold. Uh, you are in the Bay Area. You are design enlightened. You have tons of people. <laughs> we don't even understand the job description. I still have people in top companies in Europe, not only in France. And you can ask them, what is design? And they, don't, they cannot answer that. We, we are still there in many cases. And you are ahead of the curve, but you are also... Um, um, dealing with the problems sure. before we design. That's what you're talking about. So where should we go next before you get there yourself? What would you say? Does it make sense? I think so. If we want to outcompete you on design, <laughs> yeah, sure. what, what sure, should sure. we start to do now? I think, I think it ultimately comes down to understanding the values of your users how you track them back to the goals of your organization and what activities you as an organization are taking to ensure that everybody in the organization shares that knowledge. Right. Simple. Okay. Yeah, that's super right? simple. Thank you for that. Okay. Questions. Uh, on, on prend les questions en... On va avoir un peu de lumière dans la salle. On prend les questions en, en français. On a cinq minutes. Et si vous n'êtes pas à l'aise en anglais, on les traduit. Tu es à l'aise en anglais. On va démarrer là. Euh, si vous voulez poser une question... Ah, le micro est parti déjà. Je vais te donner le mien. Et ensuite, euh, ensuite euh, en haut. Um, hi. My question is, what are ways to um, foster uh, strategic and futures thinking uh, within teams? Ways to foster futures and strategic thinking. Just starting it with an easy one, huh, Sandra? Um, I think... Again, it comes down to shining a light on the problem. 
And there are a number of techniques that people could use very easily through like a brainstorm where we say, what are the current trends that we're seeing with regards to our product, our service, our user population? And let's forecast where those trends are going. And one activity that I really enjoy doing is it's a 10-year activity. So you say, where are we today with this technology? Where were we 10 years ago with this technology? That gives you an understanding of how much change can happen. Right? If you think about you know, these things, iPhones were, were introduced in 2007. So 10 years, not a lot has changed in terms of form factor. But a lot has changed inside of the product, and a lot has changed in terms of how people use them. In fact, I was shocked when I bumped into people in downtown Lyon because they were texting. I was like, oh, I thought that was only an American thing. So you've learned the bad habits too. So I think understanding just how to get into the mindset of futures thinking is a great way to start. And the, the fastest way to get there is to understand the past. And then you can start saying, what do we expect to see in the next 10 years? You'll always be wrong, right? We will always be wrong when we predict the future but we can come up with a vision of the future that sounds good and feasible, a vision of the future that sounds bad and feasible, and then typically there's this idea of a vision of the future that's just weird. And that's typically you're trying to shake your team out of the box and get them to think. And then ask yourself, if this good future truly is possible, what decisions do we need to make to get there? And what decisions do we need to, need to make to get away from the bad future? As I say to my students, is that a good dissatisfying answer? <laughs> Retro engineering, uh, a good future. Okay, <laughs> we, we have a question up there. Hi. Um, you were talking before about the chief design officer. And uh, my question is, how, why is it so rare in executive board? Why, why we don't see it? massively spread in the companies. Like, we don't doubt about CTO's role and CTO's goals. We don't doubt about C CPO roles. Why CDO is so difficult to, to, the benefits, to, pro to prove the benefits of it? Yeah, no, that's a really, that's a really brilliant question. Um, I think one of the reasons why we don't see CDOs, chief design officers, as much is because if a company, so this is optimistic, if a company is doing its job well, then design is the responsibility of each officer. So it doesn't matter if you're chief product officer, chief marketing officer, um, chief engineer, design is part of your responsibility. And if that is true, then a company doesn't need the chief design officer because chief design officer is simply uh, redundant. I think in many cases, though, the C-suite identifies what the company is optimized for. So if the company is optimized for brand, if it's optimized for profit, if it's optimized for serviceability, you're going to see those members in the C-suite. If it's not optimized for design, then you won't see that. And so I still believe that it's not seen necessarily as something executives have to worry about. But I do think that's changing. 